Okay, thanks for the uh, uh, detailed talk. But I think I'll start from the definition itself, because it seems to me you just uh, dive a demonstrate away to terrorism in general and exclude the state terrorism, which is, I think, it has been fallen from the limelight for such a long time. Probably in the 80s and 70s and so forth, there's lots of talk about state terrorism and uh, what's the implication of terrorism in the whole uh, international community or transnational uh, terrorism as well. I, I think I prefer to have the title terrorism and Islamic groups. And this is will bring you know, the uh, terrorism discourse into uh, security in that, in that sense. Because I believe there is uh, uh, the, mainly you talk about Bin Laden as a person rather than as ideology or as organization. Because when you talk about Al-Qaeda, I think it will be more and more focus on the nature of terrorism, if you like, or the use of words, which is I don't really believe uh, terrorism as, as even existed in Islam itself, because Islam, we are aware of the religion itself, how far addresses this, this, this issue, because this issue doesn't exist even as a word. You can find it as uh, probably um, part of the uh, warfare rather than as a ter actual terrorism, because Islam doesn't control that, and doesn't really sort of advance this sort of notion. notion, uh, notion. But I think we should really talk closely about the Islamic groups because we can't deny, as Muslims, we have Islamic groups who are committed or they have ideology to commit certain political violence, which is I'm not going to call it terrorism because there's a little bit of debate on that. Uh, because the majority of the, of the uh, you know, definition you have borrowed so far is Western sort of invention uh, uh, type of, 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 uh, of uh, discipline rather than from our side as Muslims. We have a problem with interpretation, of course. And that's where the key problem is lies, uh, mainly by these uh, people who are not intellectuals, they are not actually scholars in Islam, they have never attended like Islamic uh, universities like you know Azhar or Medina, or they are not really part of the Islamic uh, uh, sort of uh, theology it, and such. It, it's not it's not jurisprudence that makes them uh, commit terrorism. They don't say I'm not terrorist, then they read some verses of the Quran and say actually I will be terrorist now. Yeah. Uh, if you look at um, how uh, terrorists are created, uh, what they usually do is they just show um, uh, image after image after image of, uh, of, of dead civilians and, uh, and torture and uh, you know, brutal actions of the British and American army. And uh, if you accumulate that, a lot of people get so angry uh, that they commit to, to doing an action, uh, any kind of action. And it's more of a psychological, it's a psychological uh, uh, phenomena not nothing to do with actually the, the religion itself. And the reason being is because uh, even um, atheists, like for example the com communists, uh, the Viet, Viet Cong uh, during the Vietnam War, uh, they even had suicide squads. They actually called, called suicide squads, where they would basically just um, charge right into the uh, American American bases and and, uh, and knowing they'd die, but trying to take as many Americans out as possible as they could. Um, and a lot of them were radicalized by um, seeing that American use of of killing Vietnamese civilians. So if we see that even atheists do exactly the same things, um, and the Tamil Tigers as well, they do exactly the same things. Um, as Muslims, then, it's, then it's, it transcends the issue of religion, and actually is, is very clearly a human phenomenon. And anyone who, who says, well, we have to address it based on, it, uh, based on the fact that, these are, that they are Islamic groups, well, no, no they, are, they are human groups who are upset about something, they are upset by a cause, and they engage in these actions. Now, as Muslims, all we can really do is we can do two things. One of them is that we can... Uh, make it extremely clear, uh, which we, we have already done many times, but we can, uh, we can always uh, uh, continue doing this, just continue doing this, uh, to, to, to illustrate that, obviously, um, if you want to go and do this jihad, and you want to go uh, in terms of what you call jihad as in killing innocent civilians, uh, you, if we, oh, and we can't stop you, then, you know, then fine, but Allah's not going to reward you for it. There's no going to, you might get punished in, in, on the day of judgment, and you might go to another place than you expected on the day of judgment, and they should be made aware of this. And, and you'll find that even knowing this, some people will still probably do it anyway, because they're so angry, they don't think about it. There are Muslims who, there are Muslims who, who drink, there are Muslims who uh, take drugs, there are Muslims who are involved in mafia, there are Muslims who kill all the Muslims as part of their mafia gangs, knowing full well they'll go to hell, and they'll still do it. So that, is that an issue of Islam? Is that an issue of... They, they, uh, they, they don't know what Islam says about it. No, they have a, there is a psychological problem uh, uh, amongst uh, within them, and there's, that's, a, that's a big subject in itself as to why people will do something against what they, their religious beliefs uh, state, and this is what we have to deal with. The second uh, redress is that as Muslims, if we are just passive, when we hear of these um, 
uh, these, these attacks and, and, and killings of, of innocent civilians, then all you're really doing is you're just basically letting the frustration boil up. Uh, you, we have to um, you know, answer and respond to it, but answer and respond to it in a, very, in a wise and clever way. And that is, and there's a number of ways, well, obviously you can politically campaign, but um, I would say that the best uh, and the, the mainstream Islamic way is that in Islam we believe that the Imam, the, the Khalifa, is the shield, is the shield of the Ummah. And if we don't have an, an, a defense mechanism against being invaded, as in a, a proper army, a proper modernized army which can actually uh, stop the, the country from being invaded in the first place, and we had some unity as well amongst the Muslims, then this problem wouldn't occur in the first place, you, you see. So when uh, we, we see that in, 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 in a time that the Romans invaded Muslim lands and they stole, uh, they, they took one uh, Muslim woman hostage and they wanted basically, to, you know, with intent to rape her and so on. And when obviously the, uh, I think it was uh, Khalifa Muntasim Billah, when he heard of this uh, and he, he launched an army of invasion of the Romans, of the area where they, where they, they thought the woman was, was being kept, and the, 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 the kind of, obviously the Roman uh, emperor said, um, oh, you know, uh, look, actually, let's come to peace terms on this. And the guy said, no, you're a Roman dog. I'm gonna, you're, you're gonna get punished for this. And they got punished. And then they learned not to invade Muslim lands and kill and take uh, 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 and rape uh, uh, Muslim women. So this is the solution that's worked historically. What about Salahuddin, for example? I mean, like, you, you know, they, we, we say we need a peace process. We need to deal with, we need to, we need to deal with these enemies and maybe lobby and campaign. Look, Salahuddin didn't do that, right? Salahuddin, his peace process was, uh, firstly, his first thing was you get an army together, he conquered Egypt to make sure that the Muslims weren't you know, split, they were united, and then he went after the Crusaders, and then he effected a process that permanently got rid of Crusader aggression and raids into the Muslim, into Muslim lands. And that gave them a permanent solution. So why is we Muslims are fooling ourselves that any other solution is going to give us any, uh, any different result? It, it, it's, it's, pure, um, it's pure fantasy. That was the, the traditional solution, and this is what we have to aim for. If we don't aim for that, if we don't aim to have a proper army where we can regulate the army, we can give rules for engagement, we can have all the, the modern weapons of warfare that will avoid any civilian casualties, uh, you're going to have Muslims who take the law into their own hands and, and effectively become vigilantes. And you know what the proper vigilantes are. There's no due process, there's no court, there's no, uh, there's no procedures, and they'll, they'll kill innocent civilians, and then we get a bad rep, and then Islam gets a bad rep. So I would say that um, don't be passive. Um, Deal with the root cause of the problem. We need to be able to have a proper defense of ourselves. We need to have unity. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, you're not doing anything about that, then you're perpetuating the status quo. And you're not doing anything to stop terrorism uh, from Muslims committing terrorism. So that would be my answer for them. How do Muslims, the young Muslims in the West, so how do young Muslims in the West deal with being caught between those vehemently calling for Khilafah, groups such as Hezbo Tahrir, and on the other hand, apologist groups such as Quillian Foundation? Yes. Uh, most fall between these groups, and if they sway either way, their labels are fundamentalist or liberal. Well, okay, what I would say is, um, uh, Hizbutariya does not have a monopoly on the idea of Khilafah, on the idea of a Sharia and Islam. They're just an organization that's working towards it. They're not a school of thought, uh, as far as I know, and they're not um, some uh, sect or group. They're just a political group. It's like me setting up a, fo a football team and calling it a group or a sect. It's not. It's just an organization, and in, in Islam, um, we believe you can have political groups within Islam, that's not a problem. Many political groups in Islam, in, in, in Islam. Uh, so that's, that's not an issue. But um, what I would say is that, the, why do they call Hizbut Tahrir fundamentalist? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I mean, I've, I've encountered brothers from Hizbut Tahrir, and I've also encountered many people telling me a lot of bad things about brothers from Hizbut Tahrir. And for the life of me, um, a lot of people say, oh, today, yeah, you know, watch out for those, for those guys. And I was like, okay, and what, why is that? I don't know, I just been, I heard something about them, you know, they're just negative people or something wrong with them. It's like, okay, but is there anything you can point to me, any literature? I mean, I, I, you know, I generally try to read about all kinds of groups, Tariq Jamaat, uh, Jamaat Islami, and Ikhwan al Muslimi. I read all, I try to read as much of all these different groups as possible to get a balanced view of them. And no one's actually told me why HT is actually wrong, because they talk about Hilaf, I say, well, if, that, if that's wrong, then the Sahaba is also wrong, and the Prophet Muhammad is also wrong, and uh, and uh, the, all the classical scholars are also wrong. So I, I don't actually see the, the issue, which is the, the, the problem with them. Uh, but um, I would say that they don't have a monopoly on the issue of Khilafah or the issue of Sharia. And so if what they're really labeling HT about is that they say, because you believe in Khilafah, you're extremist. And then they say, right, do you believe in Khilafah? You must be extremist. And then it makes you scared of saying it. So I say that, look, the classical scholars were not scared of saying it. Um, all of them said it. 
It was uh, Ijma, it was the, the Sahabas, it was the Prophet Muhammad, it was so, 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 so also in the Quran as well, uh, referring to, I think, the Prophet Dawood. So if we, can, we shouldn't be ashamed of Islamic beliefs, which are our own. So it's, I don't, it's not really about HT, I'll, I'll just talk about people calling for or anyone talking for, calling for Khilafah. As for the issue of Quinim Foundation, um, they, they openly deny uh, a, lot, a lot of the parts of the Sharia, from what I've, what I've read of them, from my, my take of them. It's certainly they, they deny it, uh, and they want to espouse exactly what the, the British government wants, word for word. In fact, the British government funds them and tells them what to do. So I think it's very obvious about Quinlan Foundation are, are not really to be taken uh, seriously, and um, you know we, we shouldn't really concern ourselves. But as I said, you know you see for yourself what these people have said, what Quinlan Foundation have said. You'll see. Just, don't take my word for it. Please don't take my word for it. You go and read what they've said about the Sharia. You go read what they say about all the different points of Sharia, uh, which uh, it are, is considered controversial in the West. They, they'll just deny it or say it's not, that's not your smile, or they, well, we can reinterpret it, all kinds of things like that. So, and this is basically, um, and you'll see for yourself, and you can make a judgment for yourself whether that's actually Islamic or not, whether what they actually, I mean, some uh, people have actually commented about, about the, the members themselves, but I won't, I'm not going to uh, go there. I'll leave it for you to, to decide for yourself about them. So all I will say is, um, as young Muslims, um, your only uh, objective and purpose is to be the best Muslims you can and follow what is within Islam. And uh, you shouldn't view it as, well, if I believe Khilafah, I'll just have to join HT. Um, firstly, firstly, understand why you don't like HT if you don't like them. Understand at least why you don't like them at the very least. But look at um, the ideas that the HT are calling for, why they're being called extremists, and you'll discover that it's pretty much what we believe in anyway. So, um, all I will say is that do not give up your deen because you're facing inconveniences in, in this country. Of course, uh, there's going to be inconvenient to, be, to have, follow beliefs which obviously they, you know, we believe is from God and, and they believe it's, uh, it's just from a man in the desert, desert 1,400 years ago. Of course, they're going to call us backward. What do you think needs to be done in order to cut the roots of this idea of Islamist terrorism? Individuals going down this line are obviously getting their information from certain individuals who claim to know Islam well. How do you think the message can be transferred to these people before it gets to a point where it's too late? Well, you, you know what, it, it's, you've probably met a Muslim who w wants to believe something, and it's not Islamic, but they want to they say, no, it is Islam, nothing wrong with it. Like, I mean, I, I've even met Muslims who say, you know, drinking a little bit of alcohol is not even wrong, as long as you don't get drunk. I've encountered that, I've encountered uh, Muslims who say that, engaging in um, same gender sexual intercourse is not a sin. And they say, I'm a Muslim, I can say, I believe that. I say, really? I mean, that's really stretching the term, you know, Muslim there. And I've encountered them of all kinds of shades. And if they really want to believe it, there's nothing you can tell them that they will, for them to accept it. You know, um, I, there are Muslims who say, yes, secularism is part of Islam, liberalism is part of Islam. And back in the day during the Soviet Union, they say communism was part of Islam, and now they say feminism is part of Islam. Every ism in the West that's currently fashionable in the West just happens to be part of Islam. So, um, I mean, yeah, sure, we, uh, Islam has, uh, has rights for women, but it doesn't mean it's feminist. It's, yes, sure, uh, Islam uh, treats uh, non-Muslims uh, like a secular state, but it's not secular, because it's, it's based on, I mean, uh, they say, oh, uh, uh, look at the, the, the Prophet's constitution of Medina, that's a secular constitution. So, oh really, have you read the Constitution of Medina? Where it says, if any of you have a dispute, refer it to who? Allah and his messenger. I'd love to see a secularist say that you can have, if, you have, if, if humans should resolve their disputes by referring it to God, and that's a secular constitution. All right, it is not. So, um, so the same thing with, with quote-unquote Islamist uh, uh, terrorists. Um, if they want to do it, there's, uh, and they really are, it's their emotions that make them want to do it, not really any intellectual conviction. Uh, that comes to mind. Uh, they, if they're going to do it, they're going to do it. Uh, and all you can really do is basically, um, I, you can try to convince them. Um, mostly you should try to calm them down. That's actually, it's actually psychological, it's almost therapy. It's not intellectual, it's therapy. You have to actually just calm them down. Then they listen to reason. Then they'll stay agree with you. Right? And again, you know, what you, what you hear from Osama bin Laden in his, in his book, and the I, I, reason why I quote Osama bin Laden is because he's viewed as the, uh, the, the, the pinnacle or the exemplary man of, of, terror, of Islamist terrorism, so, and, of, which, of which all terrorists, Muslim terrorists, are deferred to. So if he's saying that basically um, he's willing to uh, kind of not follow the Prophet Muhammad's teaching, saying, oh, it's not set in stone, 
you know, the, this the idea of you know prohibition against women and children being killed, that's not set in stone. So excuse me, Osama, I believe it is set in stone, so to speak. I'm a traditional Muslim, or a classical Muslim, in terms of I follow what classical Islam says, and it's, that's not an interpretation of Islam, what you, what you say, and that's a modernist interpretation of Islam. You know, these are modernist, revivalist, whatever, reformist people, that's exactly the same logic they use to justify everything under the sun. So um, I would say that the answer to that question is, uh, you, it's not an intellectual discussion with these people because uh, they don't want to be terrorists because of a verse in the Quran or Hadith. They want to be a terrorist because they're angry, and that's it. And you have to find some ways to actually either, I would say, channel that anger in, in the in something good, like politically campaigning, doing da'wah, doing da'wah to other Muslims, encouraging unity, encouraging bringing back the Sharia, reviving, reviving the Sharia amongst the Muslim world. And, and, and amongst the understanding of the Muslims, and also just improving themselves as Muslims, improving other people as Muslims, and doing good. These are the main, all, the other, all, the, all the things they, they should be doing, and that's a good channel to divert themselves into doing rather than engaging in violence. So I think that'll be my answer to that question. My question. Brother, what's the best way of re-establishing the Khilafah when the Muslim governments are preventing it? There you go. Uh, does fighting them become an option then? Oh, fighting the Muslim governments. All right. This is a, this is the jihadi uh, belief, uh, interpretation, as they call it, in, call it, the jihadi interpretation. Okay. Um, uh, what I will say is, method um, re-establishing Khilafah. You know, when it comes to when it comes to the issue of caliphate amongst Muslims, um, or anything amongst Islam, we we don't intellectualize it with the, the, the question. We always view it in some kind of spiritual bully terms, like oh, the Khilafah. Or only Nabi Isa can bring it down, or, or Allah will bring it down, you know, like Allah will kind of, by some divine miracle, bring something into existence, you know, with us doing nothing, basically, to, to establish it. Oh, when Allah wants, it will happen. Or really, we'll stay at home and don't work, and when Allah wants you to have rizq, you can, you'll get it. All right? I mean, this is not, uh, it's not the thinking of a Muslim. The way to establish uh, or change any system is universal. The, the, the procedure is always the same. It's always the same. You start out with... Uh, you build a group, um, like um, Ibn Khaldun talked about this in his book, Muqaddimah. Um, he talked about this, that he said, why prophets always have followers around them? He said, because if a prophet basically just started to call for a, a change of a system by himself, they would kill him, and then it would be the end of, of that message. But what, what they do is they build a group of, group of sahabas around them, a group of helpers or companions, and then uh, they campaign uh, in society as a group. Because whenever you, if you hear one guy ranting about something, you go, oh, that's just one guy. If you hear a group of people saying it to you, then you think, oh, this is a social, this is something in the public arena now. You take it more seriously. So, uh, and then through, through political campaigning, you can then change the system. So you change the ideas that people have, you change their, their, their beliefs. Uh, you'll find that in the Muslim world, the reason why we don't have uh, caliphates is because people think, Maybe it's outdated, maybe it's great, it's preferable, but it's not absolutely mandatory. Or maybe it's not, it's not feasible, democracy is feasible. Because as you can see, in the Muslim world, democracy has brought us so many benefits and stability uh, in, in, our, in our countries. Um, so, um, uh, Ibn Khaldun discussed it in his book, it's, 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 it's a wonderful uh, discussion. But if you look at any, any uh, uh, method to establishing or changing any system throughout, uh, throughout human history, it's always been the same. You had, um, you had a leader, uh, or a group of leaders, they established a group, that group then campaigned, the ideas spread, and their group got bigger and bigger, and, or, and then they had just supporters, I mean, not, never, not necessarily everyone joins the group, but they had supporters, and then eventually the supporters were people in high, high positions of power, those who were generals, those who were not army, and then they had a coup or revolution, and then the system changed. It's how it works in every single um, regime change, from the French Revolution, the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, when they established communism, um, uh, the American War of Independence, and of course, how the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, uh, took Medina. Uh, you know, how did he take Medina? Uh, it wasn't just one man. It was basically he got the bayah of the uh, people who had the power, the Ahl Nusra or the Ahl Khalul Aqd, the people of the, the power brokers, the kingmakers, and then and uh, they agreed to support him. And then he, and then he didn't just say, right, now let's just establish uh, the state in Medina. He waited until the, the ideas of Islam had spread amongst the people, and they were agreeable to it. Not that they were perfect Muslims, because they were still drinking alcohol at the time. They were still doing a whole bunch of stuff, bad stuff, but they were agreeable to it. They wouldn't fight against it. And then he did the hijrah, and when he arrived, 
um, the Muslims, to, to ensure there was going to be no uh, problems, the Muslims lined up um, with their, with their with wearing animal skins and with swords uh, to greet the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi to ensure that there would be no counter coups by um, the guy who was it, Abdullah bin Ubay, who was Abdullah bin Salul, I think, who was going to be the king of, uh, of Yathrib, um, that he wouldn't do a counter coup. And all, and all the people in the accounts coup. And then they had to kind of pretend to be Muslim and be, and they called the hypocrites and so on and so forth. So this is, in a nutshell, how anyone changes a state. Uh, but you have to start with mass movement, you have to start with spreading ideas, you have to start with da'wah, and da'wah on the key issues that Muslims are not, um, uh, are having confusions over. So how does the Sharia work? How is it, you know, how is it a superior solution to uh, secularism or democracy? How is that, actually, how do you even implement this Islamic economic system? If you don't know how to, how to do that, you don't know how, how it looks like, then how can you bring it about, basically? Because when you know it, then you can tell the people about it, you see? And then when the ideas spread, it will be a matter of time where people say, you know what, we all agree that this is a solution, let's just implement it. And that's how it works, in essence. Okay, I know I've simplified it greatly, but in a nutshell, as I said, if you want to read more about this, Read Ibn Khaldun's Al-Muqaddimah on the section where it says why prophets always have supporters around them. And he discusses in brief a method of how, uh, of why prophets have supporters and how they use that to establish the deen. So I hope I've come answer that question in a, in a uh, condensed nutshell. Sure. You should have a clear distinction between jihad and terrorism. Okay? Jihad, I mean, even you know, according to Islamic law, the, the fiqh, it should come from the state, Muslim state. It shouldn't you know, um, come from individuals or certain groups calling for jihad. Sure. Quran for jihad should come from a Muslim state and also, you know, by a mufti who, like, unless it's become like a matter of self-defense where your houses or your, you know, piece of land being occupied by, you know, uh, foreign, like, troops. So, I mean, I would, I would, I'll give an example, like, Iraq. Sure. So, people in Iraq, they, they become like um, people who are defending their homes and so it's become the self-defense. Self sure. So, the, the issue... Uh, you know, is how to distinguish between terrorism and jihad, okay? Sure. Well, as I, as I try to say in my talk, um, I've tried to show sort of that Islam uh, condemns uh, what, you, what is called terrorism and supports um, a jihad, which is fighting for justice and, and so on. So this is, uh, I think... But these certain groups think, like Al-Qaeda, they, they, they call it jihad, okay? The reason being is because um, Muslims believe that jihad is fighting for justice. Um, Al Qaeda says that what we're doing is fighting for justice, ergo it's jihad. You see, that's the, that's the, 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 the kind of simple um, uh, logic. Now, um, taking taking the fight into the enemy's country and killing civilians is not uh, allowed in jihad. So I think the case would be is that what they're doing is, um, although uh, that when they say they want to defend Muslim lands, defending defending one's land from being attacked, obviously everyone. Non-Muslims, Muslims, we all agree, everyone agrees with that. But what they're doing is outside the realms of jihad, is no longer, uh, is no longer the, you know, uh, jihad. So, I mean, for example, if, if I say I want to worship God by, um, you know, uh, uh, fasting, and then I break my fast with pork and alcohol, <laughs> for example, <laughs> very, very strange for all there. But, um, you know, I, I might, and I say I'm doing this to worship God, you say, and it's like, well, okay, yes, you are, this, you are having iftar, yes, but it's not, it's not a nice iftar, according, uh, and, and so on. So, um, I, I, what I would say is that, um, yes, uh, you know, it, as Muslims, we believe in fighting for, for justice, but Osama bin Laden is not fighting for justice because he's committing injustice. It's kind of counterproductive, you know. And so this is basically um, what I would say. So, uh, I think Muslims, generally, Muslims understand, Muslims understand really the difference between jihad and terrorism. As I told you before, people who want to go and engage in terrorism, it's an emotional thing, it's not an intellectual thing. There is no confusion intellectually. All they will do when you argue with them is that they, with their vanity will say, no, no, it, 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 it is jihad, it is jihad. But that's, that's their vanity trying to defend something that their heart desires. You know, uh, it's their, it's their um, whims and desires, as they say, that is motivating them. And they're trying to defend it, but it's not, not the case. And I said, I've met Muslims who say that, that there's, nothing, there's nothing Islamically wrong we're drinking a bit of alcohol as long as you're not drunk by the alcohol. And I said, look mate, that's, that's not uh, Islam. If you say I'm a bad Muslim, and I, I'm doing that because I want to do it, I say, all right, you know, okay, it's bad what you're doing, but at least you're being honest about it, but don't try to say it's Islam. But, they're, but it's because you're challenging them, their vanity wants to say, no, no, this is Islam, don't judge me, and so on and so forth. Say, look, I'm not judging you, I'm judging what you're doing, <laughs> you're drinking alcohol. 
Yeah, so there we go. But um, So I think the distinction is quite clear. So the last question I think is quite interesting. Um, what would you recommend for us young and older Muslims to do to help our entire online, to help the Muslims in this university itself? We have discussed the issue and the problems, but what short, short advice is best for us to take action upon this? Uh, what should our next steps be? All right. Um, well, the thing is, in terms of uh, um, helping the Ummah, um, we are actually better situated to help the Ummah than uh, at any other time. Because of the internet, because of all this electronic media, um, Muslims in the Muslim world will be seeing what you write and seeing what videos you put on. And if you, if you, what you write in any language, Arabic or even English, will be read by Muslims in the Muslim world and uh, by Muslims around the world, not just in the Muslim world as well. So there is the benefit of what you're doing will reach the Muslim world. Also the fact that you probably have family, you probably have friends in the Muslim world uh, which are ignorant about Islam. And you've come to this country and in a, in a kind of strange irony you've probably learned more about Islam here. You've probably, probably learned a lot more uh, from other Muslims here than you've learned it in, in the Muslim world uh, and so on. And so you can then feed that information back because you know what it feels like now to be in a, in a society that doesn't profess to be Muslim, and that made you go back to your Islam and understand it better. And then someone who's born in a Muslim society takes it for granted uh, that, yeah, I know what Islam are, I was taught it in secondary school. I said, well, you, well chances are you probably, didn't, you, you probably don't, uh, and so on. So, uh, there's that. As for what Muslims do in this university, I would say that, well, firstly, this university is an institution of learning. Um, you can help each other learn more about, about Islam. So one of you who studies I'm not saying, says economics here, study Islamic economics, then teach your, teach your brothers and sisters about this. If you study uh, medicine, uh, for example, uh, then, uh, and, uh, and, and biological sciences, then of course uh, you can, uh, you can uh, benefit, obviously, the Muslim Ummah, and you can be uh, a good exemplar for uh, a Muslim. So, I, so to your non-Muslim friends, uh, they'll see that this person studies a lot, this person helps his, Mus uh, his Muslim brothers, he helps um, sisters, helps non-Muslim brothers and sisters in, in humanity, and uh, that's Dao. So basically, Dao is in all directions with all people, and anything you can imagine, no matter how obscure it is. You know, so you, you study food technology, I heard this university teaches food technology. Uh, you can make food and give it to, give it back to non-Muslims, and Muslims, and that's a good Dao, for example. Yeah, anything you can do will help each other. And, I mean, obviously, you're not gonna, I'm not, you can't establish a Islamic state in this, this university. So, um, and I was trying to try and say, well, how do you help the Ummah, how do you help, okay. In different situations, you do different things, basically. And amongst non-Muslims, uh, in, in, in this university, you be a good student, you help them, you be a good colleague, and you be a good example uh, to them. And in your studies, you be the best uh, person you can be. As Muslims, we have to excel at everything we do. You know, I know as Muslims, we do the bare minimum. It's like, uh, it's the symptom of our, our ideological uh, and civilizational degradation, we became uh, lethargic. We should be excelling, reaching in our, improving, reaching ideal. And that's what we should, that's, that's our, our aim. All I would say to kind of wrap it up is basically, we live in different contexts, and Islam has uh, guidance for what you should do in every context you live in, no matter how obscure it is, no matter uh, how non-related you might think it is to the Islamic Ummah. You're not, just because you're not making a video, putting it on YouTube, and, it, and broadcasting it uh, to the entire Muslim world in all um, you know, 50 languages or whatever, doesn't mean that you can't do da'wah and you don't have a role to play. You have a, all of us have a very vital role to play. And there's no role which is better than others or less than others. We all have to do it equally. Because one man can't do it by himself, one woman can't do it by himself. We do it together, inshallah.